Good evening. Tonight, the League of Women Voters of Jackson County is conducting a forum for candidates running for the John A. Logan College Board of Trustees. The forum is being hosted by the Carbondale Public Library under the direction of Jennifer Robertson. The League thanks the participants and the library for making this event possible. The Board of Trustees of John A. Logan College has three open seats and five candidates. Originally, each of the candidates had agreed to participate, but unfortunately, John Rendleman is ill and unable to join us. He's requested that the audience refer to his Facebook page for information about his candidacy, and information about that page will appear in the chat box. The other, the other candidate four candidates are here with us this evening, and I will introduce them in random order. Candidates, when I call your name, please raise your hand so the audience will know who you are. Mr. Angelo Hightower. Thank you. Mr. John Streeter. Thank you. Mr. Glenn Pichard. Thank you. Mr. Brent Clark. Thank you. And my name is Laura Davis. I'll be your moderator this evening. Let me give the audience a brief overview of the format of the program. The candidates already know what to expect. The program will begin with opening statements by each candidate. These statements will be limited to one minute. Excuse me, the openings will be limited to two minutes each. The candidates will then be asked a series of questions. Every candidate will be asked the same question and have a limit of one minute and a half to answer the questions. There will be a total of five questions. Following the question format, the candidates will have one minute each to make a closing statement. Unlike the audience, the candidates see signals on their screens, letting them know when they have 30, minute, 30 seconds left to respond and when their time has finished. Candidates, when you see the red stop signal, please finish your sentence and then stop talking. Sandy Litecki of the League of Women Voters is our timer in the background and we thank her. Candidates, any questions before we begin? Okay. We're gonna begin, as I said, with the opening statements. Prior to the forum, each of the candidates was asked to provide specific information in their opening. The information requested was the unique experiences, expertise, or perspective they will bring to the board, the communications skills they will use in keeping the board operating as a unit while addressing different points of view, and an explanation of why they want to become or remain a John A. Logan Board of Trustee. The remarks, again, are limited to two minutes, and the candidates will see the 30-second warning and red stop sign. We will proceed in alphabetical order. Candidates, there's no need to try and memorize the order. I'll call on you when it is your time to respond. We'll begin with Mr. Clark. Well, good evening. My name is Brent Clark, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting together the forum tonight to hear from the candidates that are running for the Johnny Logan College Board of Trustees. As a candidate for the Board of Trustees, I do bring some unique experiences, expertise, and perspective to this process. I've been a classroom teacher, a building principal, and a superintendent of schools for three different diverse districts. For the past 15 years, I've worked as the executive director for the Illinois Association of School Administrators known as IASA, representing school administrators in every corner of Illinois. 
Simultaneously, for the past 10 years, I've taught higher education courses at two different universities to master's and doctoral level students seeking to advance their careers in school leadership. I've played a critical role in passing complex legislation back in 2017 that overhauled the state funding formula for K-12 that today is known as the evidence-based funding model. I've also been involved with stopping bad legislation as well, in fact, many times. Over the years, I've worked with hundreds of boards of education that are trying to improve their governance model and productivity for their educational organization. I have a very open communication style, believing often that listening is more important than talking. I believe a diverse set of views is actually a healthy recipe for governing boards, and I would look forward to working together uh, in, in the, on the Board of Trustees. The reason I'm running is to be of additional help to the college, to those that attend the college, and to our Southern Illinois region in general. I believe that education is the fundamental building block of our society and our economy, and that we can improve the lives and livelihoods of people when they're given the opportunity to improve their own position in life. For me, it would be an honor to serve on the Board of Trustees, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you. Mr. Hightower. Good evening. I appreciate you guys putting this on. I, I think anyone who runs for office, and that says something about that person, uh, running for office, uh, as a lot of people may, may know, is it's not an easy undertaking, uh, quite frankly. Uh, so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, I think a lot of people, because I've spent a lot of years uh, in various capacities uh, in public service, they probably already know who I am, but I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of some of the the things that brought me here today. Uh, first off, I have a servant's heart, uh, and it all started in my Air Force days when I joined the Air Force and became a police officer. I gained a, a wide sense of, uh, of service, and I, and I swore that when I left the Air Force that I was going to take the things that I learned in the Air Force, the skills and principles, and I was going to devote it to the rest of my uh, life in serving the public. And so I became a police officer. And for many years, I, I've been a police officer. And in between all of that, I, I managed to win a seat on the uh, Marion School Board. I served four years there, two years as vice president. And we had a lot of challenges. Uh, we, frankly, we, we have a, one of the largest school districts in Southern Illinois and, you know, very uh, large budget. Actually, the budget uh, in the Marion School District is larger than the one at uh, Johnny Logan, oddly enough. Also, I, I won a seat on a Marion City Council, spent four years there. And in, in those capacities, I dealt with a lot of different personalities and I learned how to, uh, a lot of things about conflict resolution, working with other people with diverse views. And one of the things that people need to be aware of is groupthink can be a, uh, a dangerous thing when it comes to boards. And me being an independent minded person that I am, I'm not afraid to be on an island by myself and make decisions that may not necessarily be popular with other board members. But the thing is, when you disagree with other board members, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And Thank as you. far as uh, interpersonal relations. Thank uh, you, Mr. One... Hightower. Mr. Hightower, your time is up. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Pichard. I'm but sorry. There you go. I'm sorry. Let's start again, please. Okay. Can we start again? Thank there. you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this forum. I'm a veteran and a graduate of the Army School of Finance, serving in Korea, where I was awarded a meritorious service commendation. I attended SIU on the GI Bill and have received my bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from SIU. I have served as vice chancellor for administration at SIU Carbondale, chairman of the board of trustees and president of the SIU system for eight and one half years. During my tenure there, we maintained one of the best enrollments of any university in the state and Bain Corporation, which evaluates financial management of American public universities, ranked us in the top 15% of the best financially managed universities in America. 
As a member of the Illinois State Senate and the U.S. Congress, I continued my support for higher education, including the Perkins Act and federal student financial assistance programs. At the end of my congressional career, I joined the staff at Johnny Logan College as assistant to the president and lobbied effectively in Springfield for the monies to build the fitness center and the construction management building. I've served as an adjunct instructor at Logan, a board member, a trustee. 22 years ago, my wife and I joined Johnny Logan to form a foundation for abused children which serves the needs of thousands of Southern Illinois children. As chairman of the finance committee, I've worked very closely with President House and Vice President McCormick to meet my fiduciary responsibility of financial oversight. For four years in a row, we have had responsible budgets and excellent audits with no material findings. I've been trained and utilized in my entire career, a leadership from within approach, which is others centered and seeks to build unity instead of division and is accepting of others' points of view. I would like to continue to serve on the board and believe my background and experience in higher education leadership will help the college at this time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Richard. Mr. Streeter. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending. I wanna give a special thank you to the Jackson County League of Women Voters and the Carbondale Library District for sponsoring this forum. My name is John Streeter, and I'm here to ask for your vote to become your next John A. Logan trustee. I'm a resident of Carterville and lived here for 30 years. I grew up in Murfreesboro, attended SIU, and built a career in banking for the past 36 years. I'm proud to be a, a charter member of the Carterville Rotary Club. I served 25 years on the Carterville Chamber Board. I served with the Marion and Carbondale Chambers. I served as a board member for the Carterville Police and Fire Pensions. I also served 16 years on the United Methodist Children's Home Foundation Board and three years as chairman. In the two years since the last election, enrollment has continued to decline and the state is deeper in debt. It will be imperative for Logan to increase enrollment and find alternative ways to generate revenue. Once SIU was an economic engine for Southern Illinois, we need to find a path for Logan to be the next economic engine for Southern Illinois and the primary source for secondary education. It is for these reasons that I'm running again for Logan trustee. The board needs new members that will bring a new vision to the college. With my experience and reputation, I believe that I'm an ideal candidate for the board of trustees. I look forward to answering the questions this evening and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Streeter. We're now gonna move on to the question portion of the program. Prior to the forum, the league sent each of the candidates 12 questions, the same 12 questions. Five of those questions will be asked this evening. Each candidate will be asked to answer each question and their responses are limited to one and a half minutes. The questions will begin in alphabetical order but the order will rotate to allow each candidate the opportunity to answer first. Again, to the candidates, there's no need to try and memorize or predict the order. I will say your name when it is your turn to answer. And please ask me if you need me to repeat the question. Question number one, and we're gonna begin with Mr. Clark. Do you believe John A. Logan College is meeting the employment and workforce needs of the region. Using some specific examples, how can the college better align its offerings, including certificates and degrees, to the local labor markets and employer needs? Again, Mr. Clark, we'll begin with you. Thank you for the question. I believe Johnny Logan College is frankly doing a very good job. I'm running to assist and hopefully help them uh, in the lineup even do better. If elected, I'm very interested in convening all of our college districts, public and private high schools with the college and working with them to develop a post high school graduation plan 
for every high school student, specifically our seniors. The plan would be simply this, uh, that every student coming out of high school would either have some, some plan to, to attend college, possibly at Johnny Logan, possibly at another institution, possibly construction trades. But the goal would be sure they have a plan and they know what their options are. And then we could have a transitional program so that we don't drop students between graduation and college starting. <clears throat> we have some students that drop off during the summer slide. And I think it's important to remember our adult learners who are very vital to our economy and our region. And uh, there's always a good partnership with Mantracon. And I think those partnerships between Mantracon and Johnny Logan will continue into the future. So I think there's a lot of possibilities that we can do. We can get credential jobs, we can get construction trades, but every student coming in needs to have a plan uh, when they're leaving high school. <clears throat> and I think John A. Logan can be a central player in convening all of those students together in one location. Thank you. Mr. Hightower. Yes, and, and I agree with that. Uh, I think that every student should have a plan and we have to put as much focus on vocational education as much as we do this regular academic uh, education. But one thing I would like to do is partner with local governments and um, start a fund that incentivizes going to college for a trade or you know an academic program. And also uh, maybe perhaps a task force with various employers where we discuss deficiencies they have in their particular, uh, their business and see if we can align students. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought someone said, yeah. and we can align students and steer them towards those particular programs. And I think that as a board that we need to have a relationship with every school district's uh, guidance counselors because they're, they're aware of specific issues with, with their students and, and they can assist in that, uh, that endeavor. And so I think we all need to work as a team, come up with solutions, and we can restore John A. Logan to its premier status as one of the best junior colleges in the country and make people want to come there. And I think we can do that if we work as a team. Thank you. Mr. Pichard. Here's what's important. The collection and use of real-time labor market information is essential in making the appropriate alignment in education and training with the needs of the economy and the region. Our people in workforce education go out into the region. They talk to businesses, to labor unions. They go to employer websites. They look at job ads. They analyze the data quickly and in real time determine what's being required in hiring trends and skill requirements. Counselors then use that information to guide students toward programs and course offerings tied to occupations with strong employment and earning potentials. The key is that this data has to be collected frequently and released quickly. The Illinois Department of Employment Security compiles extensive real-time data for this purpose in looking at the needs of specific regions. Locally, Mantracon in Marion is a leading agency in workforce training and development, and we work with them to compile this data and make it available to colleges throughout the area. Areas where Logan has been successful include the retraining of laid off coal miners, more recently the healthcare industry in creating nursing programs with SIU Edwardsville and developing a cyber security program, which many businesses need in this day and time. All of these are excellent examples of responding to economic needs through our workforce education programs. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Streeter. Mr. Streeter, you need to unmute. Sorry about that. It keeps on popping off the gallery view. So um, I do feel that the college is adequately meeting the needs of the region, but I think we can do more. As a business leader, I feel that uh, we can work with businesses and that we need to create a higher pool, uh, pool of higher skilled employees. The college in the past has had a robust business and industry program, and I think we need to rebuild that program to meet the needs of our growing uh, region. High schools are reducing trades classes, so that's an area where we can, the college can reinvest in the trades and, and uh, 
educate businesses and business specific programs. For example, I'm in the banking industry and very few people have the qualifications we need for frontline tellers and back office personnel. The college can work with banks, other industries to develop special programs specific to their needs. In this case, for banks, we can set up a training program and an education program that prepares individuals to be employed in the banking field. I think there's many other businesses out there that we can do the same type of training and build that skilled workforce that we need to move into the future. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the second question and we're gonna begin with Mr. Hightower this time. The question is, how has the pandemic affected the college finances and what are ways to make up the lost revenue? Mr. Hightower. Well, obviously attendance has been down. I believe that John A may be working at 20% attendance because of the pandemic and other, it's just kind of, it's a hybrid model where it's partially online, partially in person. Uh, one of the things I think that John Hay has failed to do over the years is have more night classes. Uh, as you know, there are a lot of non-traditional uh, college students who have to work. And if you end uh, the school day at, at four or five o'clock, then that's not going to tap into a lot of potential uh, students. And of course, when you don't tap into more students, you're going to lose out on revenue. So I think that that's something that we need to look at uh, because it, we're in a precarious situation, quite frankly, when it comes to state funding. I mean, in the last couple of years, they've done a, a decent job at funding uh, community colleges, but we don't know what future administrations are going to do. We don't know what future economies are going to be like. And so we have to take it upon ourselves to uh, look into outside the box ideas. Um, and another thing we can possibly do is, uh, you know, we can channel our international, uh, you know, students and maybe we can advertise outside of the region and make people from other countries want to want to come here. We just have to, you know, put our heads together, come up with solutions. And I, I think we can do it if we work as a team. Thank you. Mr. Pichard. Glenn, you need to un unmute yourself. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> The most dramatic effect has been on the decline in enrollment, but particularly freshman enrollment, which is down about 13.1% nationwide. High school graduates going straight to college are down about 22%, and this is driven mostly by losses of low-income students. Our most vulnerable students aren't going to college. How can we make up the lost revenue? Well, there are many ways, but let me mention two. Because the loss of our most vulnerable students will have lasting social and economic effects on our communities, we must do intensive marketing and outreach to these impacted populations to get them back in school. This is a high priority for rebuilding enrollment and therefore finances for the college. Marketing and outreach are crucial to rebuilding enrollment. Secondly, the original CARES Act had $150 billion appropriated to states, but only $2.2 billion went to higher education. Now, in the American Rescue Plan Act, there's $350 billion going to the states and $40 billion dedicated to higher education. This money cannot be diverted to other needs at the state level, as many flow through funds from the federal government often is. We have to get our fair share at Logan, and I intend to lobby for it. This could go a long way for making up lost revenues to our campus. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Streeter. The pandemic shut down the college, just as it uh, has with most businesses in 2020. The board recently reported enrollment had declined by 14% in 2020 which severely affects our funding. There is no remedy to really recover this lost revenue. I'm confident that the state will not use any of the federal relief funds to reimburse colleges for lost revenue. 2020 is past history. We need to move forward. Johnny Logan needs to look at 
uh, new ways to generate new revenue through more online programs and other sources. So we're less exposed to these misfortunes. A future health crisis may be around the corner. So we must prepare for the possibility of a new crisis. Institutions of higher education are turning towards online degrees. This has to be a focus that the college looks to fulfill in the next two to three years. We have to find new ways to generate revenue so that uh, we're not exposed to any of these problems in the future. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. That was the phrase of 2020, unmute yourself. <laughs> Like most institutions around the country, John A. has experienced a decline in enrollment. It's nothing new, and that directly impacts the finances. At the same time, a sustained disinvestment by the state has contributed to a declining balance sheet. Revenue can either be developed through increasing enrollment, pursuing public-private partnerships, or by raising the property tax levy. There's no disagreement that property taxes are too high, and that's not a viable option. So that leads back to my plan to engage every high schooler in our college district with an eye towards attracting more enrollment. That's the marketing and the outreach that Dr. Pichard referenced. The college's mission is to be a service to the region in a variety of ways. And as to something that I would like to see expanded, it would be the availability of online courses. We've actually noticed uh, during the pandemic over the last 12 months that some students have performed extremely well while they were working online. Having a substantial offering of online courses for our adult learners, those that are in their early to mid careers, 20 to 40 years old, uh, those are the importance, uh, important programs for their lives and their livelihoods. And we think that that's really important to the citizens. But just throwing ideas out there won't move the needle. The college needs a comprehensive strategic plan with the primary pillar being that of addressing enrollment. Without a plan, I'm fearful that the college will continue to drift and if elected, I'll be leading the charge for a well-developed strategic plan to address the enrollment decline. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the third question now. For the new candidates, how have you educated yourself about the position of the college trustee? And what are your goals? For the incumbent, describe a vote you have made as a trustee that you might do differently now. And we're gonna begin with Mr. Pichard. Sure, I'm unmuted, okay. There you go. Yes, I've been very vocal in my opposition to calling too many executive sessions. There are legitimate reasons for them and the law specifies what those reasons are. There is a reason, however, that the open meetings laws have been passed in this country. And here's the reason, because the best policy is sunshine on everything. Transparency is much more possible in open meetings than closed. Here's why I believe caution should be exercised in going into executive sessions behind closed doors. It's too easy for a board to get caught in the trap of discussing subjects other than the one intended. So often there's little clarity on the distinction of discussing an issue and reaching a consensus on a subject not intended for the executive session. I've been in executive sessions where discussions have taken place and I've gotten calls the next morning from people who knew every detail of what took place in that session. Many times, the slip of a board member in discussing what went on in those sessions have started destructive rumors that have hurt people. Obviously, a good legal counsel can steer the board away from these gray areas, and I believe we have that kind of counsel. But this is something that requires constant vigilance, and I will continue to bring this to the attention of the full board. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Streeter. Thank you. I have a 36-year career in banking, and I've been part of many boards. Much of the work is the same in setting policy, managing budgets, and building on the mission of the organization. The difference with the community college is in the people that we serve and the larger territory that we cover. My goals are simple, 
I want to build on Logan's success in athletics, nursing, and cybersecurity programs. We need to recruit more students and increase the size of these programs. I want to work with skilled trade unions to set up joint programs where students can learn the trade through the union and learn business through a certificate or associate's degree. We can then educate our skilled labor force on how to run a successful business and create more jobs. I want to work with businesses in the communities to implement training programs to create a higher skilled workforce that's immediately employable. I want to work with the high schools in our district to ensure that students understand the various options that they have with working uh, with skilled labor, working towards higher education. Thank you. Mr. Clark, I'm sorry. No problem. I've, I've actually taken time to talk with every uh, current trustee or visited with them in person if that was more comfortable with them. I've talked with a range of current employees from John A and I've visited with nearly every regional business and elected leader about John A and what needs to happen. And I've been involved with educational governance for nearly 30 years at some level. So I feel like I have a very strong grasp on what is expected and required for the position of a college trustee and why it's important to our area and what it does for our future. In fact, on a daily basis, I'm involved at some question or issue around the state on board governance administration relative to somebody's educational organization. My goals are very clear and straightforward. Number one, make sure every high school student has a post high school plan, whether it be college, construction trades, joining the military, or some other employable track, but at least have a plan for them and make them aware of the multiple options. Number two, find ways to put Johnny Logan College central to the economic development for the Southern Illinois region with a very robust campus-wide strategic plan which would address enrollment. And number three, ensure physical transparency and accountability for everyone involved up and down the line. If elected, I look forward to contributing to the Board of Trustees and continuing the Johnny Logan College tradition of excellence. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hightower. Yes, uh, being on, on a board, a school board at Marion and also on the Marion City Council, I have a very good idea on, on the process and how boards operate. And so I think it'll be a seamless transition. I'll be ready on day one, no question. Three of the things that I would like to see done is I think the budget process needs to be more streamlined. Uh, the budget process, as anybody who serves on the board knows, it calls for a lot of consternation among people who have to get their budgets together. And I think that it should be more of an ongoing process throughout the year where people meet and align their objectives and make sure that the money is there for it. And so whenever budget time comes, there will be no surprises. Uh, number two, I think that we do need to repair the disconnect that still exists between the board and the staff. And you do that by having regular dialogue and where you promote an atmosphere where people feel comfortable voicing their opinions on how to do things better. And I, I just think if we do that, then you have a better product. Uh, I think uh, transparency is another thing, and Glenn alluded to it. I'm not a fan of executive sessions. And I've been on boards that, that we, quite frankly, went way too much. And, and our, a lot of our discussion in the executive session went beyond the scope of its intended purpose. And so I think that we need to watch that. And, you know, transparency goes a long way. We just we need to follow that. We do those three things. I think that, you know, Johnny and Logan would be well on their way to being restored to their form of glory as one of the top junior colleges in the country. And God willing, and with you guys' help, I like to be a part of that process. Thank you. We're going to move to question four. What are the boundaries of a board member's position in relation to the affairs of the college? Should the board be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the college? Say, for example, in personnel and staffing. And we're going to begin with Mr. Streeter. Thank you. Uh, board members, should not micromanage and should not be involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the college. It is the, board, the responsibility of a board to hire strong administration that will run the college on a day-to-day -day basis. 
A board has the responsibility to establish policy and set goals for the success of the college. Board members can and should use their resources and their influence to assist with recruitment and strategic planning within the region. With regards to hiring, again, they should leave the hiring practices to the administration that they have uh, set forth. But the board will play an active role in hiring administration that will run the college. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Any governance board, including the Johnny Logan College Board of Trustees, at a very high level should set policy, hire the highest quality administrators, faculty, and staff possible, and then hold those employees responsible for their job duties while ensuring that adequate resources are allocated for the completion of their assignments. Taking that a level or two deeper, a trustee is one that should focus not only on the immediate performance of the college, but also keep an eye on the future, knowing that your responsibility is that you're actually a caretaker in between and alongside other individuals that have been elected to share exactly the same responsibility. A trustee has a physical responsibility to carefully review the audit, which is a report looking back, as well as setting a budget, which is establishing spending priorities for the future. As a trustee, we have a responsibility to listen to the community's needs, the taxpayers' abilities, as well as advocate in the political arena for the affairs of the college. I do not believe that trustees should be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the college by making unscheduled visits to classes, labs, or activities. However, when invited, I think you should be reasonably available to see a program in progress, talk with an end user, and get their feedback, as well as listen to the faculty and staff with respect to their thoughts on the progress or the lack thereof. I believe a trustee has an important role, but certainly within certain boundaries. Thank you. Mr. Hightower. I think we're all in agreement that I don't think we should micromanage the board. I mean, we have a lot of high quality staff and we just need to let them do their job. Frankly, the, 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 the basic job that we have as board members is a fiduciary duty. And beyond that, we just need to make sure that everyone's on the same page and that we can do that by having ongoing dialogue with the with various staff members. Uh, we can have like some sort of liaison to uh, make constant contact with staff and make sure that their goals align with the goals of the college and everyone's on the same page at the end. But there's no need to micromanage their duties because like I said, they're, they're professionals, they're highly trained and they know a whole lot about what they're doing and we do as board members. So we need to just trust the process, trust them, let them do their jobs and, and we all be okay. Thank you. Mr. Pichard. Glenn, you need to unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Okay. Here are the boundaries of a board member's position. We have a duty of care to oversee management, to provide strategic direction, attend and actively participate in board meetings, and be informed about critical issues. We have a duty of loyalty, and that's to put personal agendas aside and keep the college and the students at the forefront of board policy. We have a duty of obedience to act ethically, to comply with board bylaws and codes of conduct, as well as state and federal laws and regulations. With these parameters, we have a fiduciary duty, meaning to act on behalf of others, in our case, the public. We should not be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the college. That belongs to the president and his administrative team. As an example, as chairman of the finance committee, our committee has oversight authority on such things as expense reports, contracts, maintaining budget execution, monitoring internal controls. I believe our committee has made an important contribution in working with the administration to achieve outstanding audits each year with no material findings. This speaks to both the board and the administration working together in their separate roles to achieve success. Since I've been on the board, we've had the highest accreditation by the Higher Learning Commission, a 10 year accreditation. We have enrollment decline, but not as great as most of the community colleges in the state. Thank and we've you. had four years of excellent audits with no material findings. Thank you. Thank you. 
We're going to move to question five, and this one's going to begin with Mr. Clark. What do you see as the two most pressing challenges facing educators in John A. Logan in 2021? Again, Mr. Clark. So first of all, I mean, it's the obvious is the pandemic and uh, the, trying to return to campus, uh, both for learning, athletics, and activities. And uh, we, you know, just today, the governor announced a new bridge phase to move us in Illinois, restore Illinois from phase four to phase five. But at the end of the day, it's going to be about vaccine distribution and how we can accelerate that in order to be ready for next fall, if not sooner, to open the doors fully. Monit number two, monitoring and responding to the social and emotional toll that the past 12 months has taken both on the students as well as the employees will be a fairly important role that I think the Board of Trustees should be monitoring and looking at. The isolation and the lack of social interactions and basic elimination of events and opportunities that people truly enjoy has taken its toll and we need to recognize this fact, be responsive as a board so that we can get everyone back up and running at full speed. And then you can underscore both of those things with securing a life-sustaining budget appropriation through the state of Illinois budgeting cycle that's actually happening right now. And it's very important to the students, the employees and the taxpayers. So two priorities underscored by a, a funding uh, a priority. Thank you. Mr. Hightower. Am I on? You are. Okay, it has a message saying I'm on mute myself. Yes, uh, I, I think the two uh, main problems we're facing is going to be some residual leftover from the, the COVID virus, uh, and also which affects enrollment. Obviously, uh, that's more short term. Hopefully, uh, there's <clears throat> excuse me, there's help on the horizon on that front. But I, I have to go back to my main issue. I think one of the things that, that's left over from you know years of what's seen as reprisal from uh, board members is we have to this we we have to uh, repair that disconnect that exists between a board and staff. I mean, we're not gonna go realize our full potential if we don't do that. And again, it just comes with ongoing dialogue between staff and the board. I mean, we have to do that, that's critical. And, and until we understand that, we're not gonna go as far as we can go. And I can't underscore that enough. So if we do those two issues, I think we're gonna go a long way. And again, John A is a fine college, still one of the best around but we still need to realize our full potential. And I, I'm very confident we can do that. Thank you. Mr. Pichard. Okay. There you go. I think the most pressing challenge is to return the campus to a full sense of normalcy. And that means we'll probably still be dealing with the effects of the pandemic. There are so many variants out there that are manifesting themselves right now and so many people who are remaining unvaccinated that reaching a critical mass, which can make us feel absolutely safe, is going to be difficult. We will still face the challenge of loss of enrollment and the challenge, therefore, of lack of finances, of the additional cost of protecting the health, safety, and welfare of everyone who walks on this campus, a, tax, a task that we've proven that we can do but may have to continue. The challenge will be, how do we get these young people back in school? And how do we give all of our employees the sense of safety they need to carry on effectively? The second major challenge will be how we manage a difficult budget going forward with a potential loss of revenue, which may still be associated with the loss of enrollment and the additional cost of the pandemic. Will we be able to maintain our strong academic reputation in the face of potentially declining revenues, which may affect our programmatic efforts? Will we be able to avoid additional borrowing? Will we be able to continue to keep our tuition and fees low? Will a difficult financial year impact our ability to serve the business and labor needs in the region? These are the kinds of challenges that we could face in a very difficult year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Streeter. Thank you. Uh, I see the two challenges. Primary cha the primary challenge will be budget and finances, as Finn mentioned. 
In the state of Illinois, we continue to lose taxpayers, which drives down revenue. We'll continue to see a decrease of funding to, higher, to institutions of higher education. So one of the things that the college will have to focus on is some tough budget decisions this next year. But we also need to be working on finding alternative sources of revenue so that we're not deeply exposed as we normally have been. The second challenge I believe is offering de degree programs through 100% online education. We've seen through the pandemic that using these type of uh, online services, Zoom and other measures is the wave of the future. Everybody is waking up to this process and accepting this process. This seems to be the likely process for 50% of higher education students that choose, that's going to choose online education. So Logan has to adapt to this alternative delivery and we've got to continue to adapt to new delivery services of education. Thank you. That concludes the questioning portion of the program and we're gonna to move to the closing statements. The candidates will now have one minute to make a closing statement. The statements will be given in reverse alphabetical order and we're gonna begin with Mr. Streeter. Thank you. In closing, I wanna thank everyone for taking time this evening to join us and learn about your candidates. I also wanna thank again, the League of Women, League of Women Voters Sorry, I get tongue tied after all this talking. And the Carbondale Library District for hosting this event. As your next trustee, I wanna offer a new vision of cooperation with faculty and staff. A vision that holds administration and board members accountable for enrollment growth and financial success. A vision that engages the communities we serve and provides a strong economic engine for those communities a vision that seeks cooperation with trade organizations and businesses to improve education. It's now time for you to decide who you want to lead John A. Logan College into the future. I believe I have that vision and experience to carry out the mission. I ask for your support on April 6th. Please vote for John Streeter as your next John A. Logan trustee. Thank you. Mr. Pichard. I appreciate the League of Women Voters for providing this forum and the public service that you do for our area. Jennifer, thank you and the Carbondale Public Library for your partnership with the League and providing the service. I've had some wonderful jobs in my career, but I'm equally excited about this job. Every time there's been a crisis in my career, I took it as an opportunity to show that we could overcome. The pandemic has given us this opportunity again. And look at the resilience our people have shown, the creativity they've employed, the new model teaching and learning classes that they've developed. And there are more great ideas yet to come because our students' education is important to us. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that great mission? This is an exciting time to be a part of Johnny Logan College and I'd like to continue to serve and would appreciate your vote. Thank you very much. Mr. Hightower. Yes, again, thank you for having us. This, I appreciate you guys putting this on and giving the voters a more clear view on the choices they have. Uh, simply put, I, I've done this uh, on, on other boards and, and I'm prepared on day one to, to do what's required to to move this college forward. And I'm in my capacity as a school board member, city council, many years as a police officer, I've gained a reputation for fairness, honesty, and integrity, and just doing the right thing. And I, I'm a straight shooter. I'm always gonna give it to you straight. I'm not about talking points or, you know, I'm, I'm about getting results. And I think it, it, it's important for people to know that. You know, a lot of people have, you know, certain skill sets, but if you're looking for experience and honesty, integrity and, and results, and I, hopefully you guys have 
dark and that oval for me on April 6th. Thanks. Thank you. In a typical forum, this would be the time that we would ask the audience to give a round of applause to all the participants. Tonight, we're gonna to have to do with a heartfelt thanks to the participants from the League of Women Voters. Did you forget Brent Clark? I did, did I forget you, Brent? I did. Dr. Clark, Mr. Clark, I am so sorry. It's okay, no problem. Okay. You want me to go? Please go ahead. Okay. Johnny Logan, in my opinion, is essential to, an essential ingredient in the building a better, safer, more comfortable life for everyone in Southern Illinois. In the greatest of ways, John A. serves our region and serves our people in the region. It trains and teaches people in a wide range of skills and traits that directly contributes to the life that we all get to enjoy. From healthcare to automotive, from business to education, from construction to entertainment, Johnny Logan College is more than a landmark on Route 13. It's an economic and quality of life anchor for the entire Southern Illinois region. Keeping John A. financially healthy, educationally competitive, and regionally essential are my overarching goals as a trustee, and I look forward to working with all interested parties to make it even better going forward. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Carbondale Public Library for hosting us tonight, and thanks to those that tuned in online. We sure appreciate it, and I would appreciate your vote and support on April the 6th. Thank you. Okay, I think I, I think we've got everybody now. Again, my apologies, Mr. Clark. Typically, we would uh, have applause for the candidates. That's not possible tonight. The League of Women Voters gives, however, our heartfelt thanks to the participants. Uh, the League acknowledges that this has been a new experience for all of us and took some additional effort in cooperation to make it happen. And we thank you. None of this would have been possible without the Carbondale Public Library and Jennifer Robertson. Thank you again for stepping in and providing our community with this important public service. Before we end, the League wants to encourage the audience to utilize the information learned here tonight by voting on April 6th. While you can always vote at your polling place on April 6th, on election day, please contact your county clerk for specifics about early voting in your county. In Jackson County, early voting is available from eight to four every day in the Jackson County Clerk's Office in the courthouse. The clerk's office will also be open for early voting on Saturday, April 3rd from, from eight to noon. Early voting for all polling centers in Jackson County will be available at the Carbondale First United Methodist Church, 214 West Main Street in Carbondale on March 22nd and April 1st from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The relocation of this uh, polling place from the Carbondale Civic Center is due to the fact that that facility is being used for vaccinations. Also at, SIU, at the SIU Student Center, one more early voting day is available and that is March 24th from 9 a.m. to 3. 